Hi, Grandma here reading uh, The Hiding Place by Cory Tin Boom. Uh, today I'm going to read uh, half of chapter 10. And um, just to review a little bit about chapter 9, um, their home, the Baye, was raided, and everybody that was found inside was taken to the police headquarters in Harlem where people were interrogated and beaten for information. They don't believe the Jews were found. However, the uh, Nazis, the Gestapo, have uh, told them that uh, they will surround the house and watch it constantly and, until uh, the Jews turn into mummies. So we don't know what happened to them. Um, but now, after being interrogated, they are uh, leaving town and they don't know where they're going. Corey is still sick. Uh, she still hasn't eaten anything. She's feverish. Um, and that's where our story begins. Chapter 10. And I'm going to try to read this, the name of this chapter. Shevinigan. Shevinigan. Um, and that is probably the name of a town. Outside Harlem, the bus took the South Road, paralleling the sea. On our right rose the low, sandy hills of the dune country. Soldiers silhouetted on the ridges. Clearly, we were not being taken to Amsterdam. A two-hour drive brought us instead into the streets of The Hague. The bus stopped in front of a new, functional building. Word was whispered back that this was the Gestapo headquarters for all of Holland. We were marched all but Pickwick, who seemed unable to rise out of his seat, into a large room where the endless process of taking down names, addresses, occupations began all over again. On the other side of the high counter, running the length of the room, I was startled to see Wilmza and Captain. Now those are the two officers that came into their home and arrested everyone. As each of the prisoners from Harlem reached the desk, one or the other would lean forward and speak to a man seated at a typewriter, and there would be a clatter of sound from the machine. Suddenly, the chief interrogator's eye fell on Father. That old man, he cried, did he have to be arrested? You, old man. Billum led Father up to the desk. The Gestapo chief leaned forward, I'd like to send you home, old fellow, he said. I'll take your word that you won't cause any more trouble. I could not see Father's face, only the erect carriage of his shoulders and the halo of white hair above them, but I heard his answer. If I go home today, he said evenly and clearly, tomorrow I will open my door again to any man in need who knocks. The amiability drained from the other man's face. Get back in line, he shouted. Schnell, this court will tolerate no more delays. But delays seemed all that this court existed for. As we inched along the counter, there were endless coming and going of officials. Outside the windows, the short winter day was fading. We had not eaten since the rolls and water at dawn. Ahead of me in line, Betsy answered, unmarried, for the 20th time that day. Number of children, droned the interrogator. I'm unmarried, Betsy repeated. The man did not even look up from his papers. Number of children, he snapped. No children, said Betsy resignedly. Toward nightfall, a stout little man wearing a yellow star was led past us to the far end of the room. A sound of scuffling made us all look up. The wretched man was attempting to hold on to something clutched in his hands. It's mine, he kept shouting. You can't take it. You can't take my purse. What madness possesses him? What good did he imagine money would do him now? But he continued to struggle to the obvious glee of the men around him. Here, Jew, I heard one of them say. He lifted his booted foot and kicked the small man in the back of his knee. This is how we take things from a Jew. It made so much noise. That was all I could think as they continued to kick him. 
I clutched the counter to keep from falling myself at the sounds continued. Wildly, unreasonably, I hated the man being kicked, hated him for being so helpless and so hurt. At last I heard them drag him out. Then all at once I was standing in front of the chief questioner. I looked up and met Captain's eyes just behind him. The woman was the ringleader, he said. Through the turmoil inside me, I realized it was important for the other man to believe him. What Mr. Captain says is true, I said. These others, they know nothing about it. It was all my name, the interrogator inquired imperturbably. Cornelia Tin Boom, and I'm the age 52. The rest of the people had nothing to do. Occupation? <sighs> I've told you a dozen times, I burst out in desperation. Occupation, he repeated. It was dark night when we marched at last out of the building. The green bus was gone. Instead, we made out the bulk of a large canvas-roofed army truck. Two soldiers had to fit father over the tailgate had to lift father over the tailgate. There was no sign of Pickwick. Father, Betsy, and I found places to sit on a narrow bench that ran around the sides. The truck had no springs and bounced roughly over the bomb-pitted streets of The Hague. I slipped my arm behind father's back to keep him from striking the edge. Willem, standing near the back, whispered back what he could see of the blacked-out city. We had left the downtown section and seemed to be headed west toward the suburb of Shevinigan. That was our destination then, the federal penitentiary named after the seaside town. The truck jerked to a halt. We heard a screech of iron. We bumped forward a few feet and stopped again. Behind us, massive gates clanged shut. We climbed down to find ourselves in an enormous courtyard surrounded by a high brick wall. The truck had backed up to a long, low building. Soldiers prodded us inside. I blinked in the white glare of bright ceiling lights. Nassen Gagen Mauer, noses to the wall. I felt a shove from behind and found myself staring at a cracked plaster. I turned my eye as far as I could, first left, then right. There was Willem, two places away from him, Betsy. Next to me on the other side was Toos, all like me, standing with their faces to the wall. Where was father? There was an endless wait while the scars on the wall before my eyes became faces, landscapes, animal shapes. Then somewhere to the right, a door opened. William, excuse me, women prisoners, follow me. The matron's voice sounded as metallic as the squeaking door. As I stepped away from the wall, I glanced swiftly around the room for father. There he was, a few feet from the wall, seated in a straight back chair. One of the guards had brought it for him. Already the matron was starting down the long corridor that I could see through the door, but I hung back gazing desperately at Father, Willem, Peter, all our brave underground workers. Father, I cried suddenly, God be with you. His head turned toward me, the harsh overhead light flashed from his glasses, and with you, my daughters, he said. I turned and followed the others. Behind me, the door slammed closed, and with you, and with you. Oh, Father, when will I see you next? Betsy's hand slipped around mine. A strip of coconut palm matting ran down the center of the wide hall. We stepped onto it off the damp concrete. Prisoners walked to the side. It was the bored voice of the guard behind us. Prisoners must not step on the matting. Guiltily, we stepped off the privileged path. Ahead of us in the corridor was a desk, behind it a woman in uniform. As each prisoner 
reached this point, she gave her name for the thousandth time that day and placed on the desk whatever she was wearing of value. Nolly, Betsy, and I unstrapped our beautiful wristwatches. As I handed mine to the officer, she pointed to the simple gold ring that had belonged to Mama. I wriggled it from my finger and laid it on the desk along with my wallet and paper gilders. That's money. The procession down the corridor continued. The walls on both sides of us were lined with narrow metal doors. Now the column of women halted. The matron was fitting a key into one of the doors. We heard the thud of a bolt drawn back, the screech of hinges. The matron consulted a list in her hand, then called the name of a lady I didn't even know, one of them who had been at Willem's prayer meeting. Prayer meeting. Was it possible that it had only been yesterday? Was this only Thursday night? Already the events at the Baye seemed part of another lifetime. The door banged shut, the column moved on, another door unlocked, another human being closed behind it. No two from Harlem in the same cell. Among the very first names read from the list was Betsy's. She stepped through the door before she could turn or say goodbye. It had closed. Two set cells further on, Nolly left me. The clang of these two doors rang in my ears as the slow march continued. Now the corridor branched and we turned left, then right, then left again, an endless world of steel and concrete. Ten boom, Cornelia, another door rasped open. The cell was deep and narrow, scarcely wider than the door. A woman lay on the single cot, three others on straw ticks on the floor. Give this one the cot, the matron said, she's sick. And indeed, even as the door slammed behind me, a spasm of coughing seized my chest and throat. We don't want a sick woman in here, someone shouted. They were stumbling to their feet, backing as far from me as the narrow cubicle would allow. I, I, I'm so sorry, I began, but another voice interrupted me. Don't be. It isn't your fault. Come on, Frau Mikes, give her the cot. The young woman turned to me, let me hang up your hat and coat. Gratefully, I handed her my hat, which she added to the row of clothing hanging from hooks along one wall. But I kept my coat wrapped tightly around me. The cot had been vacated and I moved shakily toward it, trying not to sneeze or breathe as I squeezed past my cellmates. I sank down on the narrow bed, then went into a fret, fresh paroxysm of coughs as a cloud of choking black dust rose from the filthy straw mattress. At last the attack passed and I lay down. The sour straw smell filled my nostrils. I felt each slant of wood through the thin pallet. I will never be able to sleep on such a bed, I thought. And the next thing I knew it was morning and there was a clattering at the door. Food call, my cellmates told me. I struggled to my feet. A square of metal had dropped open in the door, forming a small shelf. Onto this, someone in the hall was placing tin plates filled with steaming gruel. There's a new one here, the woman called Frau Mikes, called through the aperture. We get five portions. Another tin plate was slammed on the shelf. If you're not hungry, Frau Mikes added, I'll help with it. I picked up my plate, stared at the watery gray porridge and handled it silently to her. In a little while, the plates were collected and the pass through the door slammed shut. Later in the morning, a key grated in the lock. The bolt banged and the door opened long enough for the sanitary bucket to be passed out. The wash basin was also emptied and returned with clean water. The women picked up their straw pallets from the floor, piled them in a corner, raising a fresh storm of dust, which started me coughing helplessly again. Then a prison boredom, which I soon learned to fear above all else, settled over the cell. At first I attempted to relieve it by talking with the others, 
But though they were as courteous as people can be, who are living literally on top of one another, they turned aside my questions and I never learned much about them. The young woman who had spoken so kindly to me the night before, I did discover was a baroness, only 17 years old. This young girl paced constantly from morning until the overhead light went out at night. Six steps to the door, six steps back, dodging those sitting on the floor, back and forth like an animal in a cage. Frau Mikes turned out to be an Austrian woman who had worked as a charwoman in an office building that's a cleaning woman. She often cried for her canary, poor little thing, what will become of him? They'll never think to feed him. This would start me thinking of our cat. Had Maher Shalal Hashbaz made his escape into the street or was he starving inside the sealed house? I would picture him prowling among the chair legs in the dining room, missing the shoulders he loved to walk on. I tried not to let my mind venture higher in the house, not to let it climb the steps to see if Thea, Mary, Yusi, no, I could do nothing for them here in this cell. God knew they were there. One of my cellmates had spent three years here in Shevinigan. He could hear the she could hear the rattle of the meal cart long before the rest of us and tell by the footstep who was passing in the corridor. That's the trustee from medical supply, someone sick. This is the fourth time someone in 316 has gone in for a hearing. Her world consisted of this cubicle and the corridor outside. And soon I began to see the wisdom of this narrowed vision and why prisoners instinctively shied away from questions about their larger lives. For the first days of my imprisonment, I stayed in a frenzy of anxiety about Father, Betsy, Wilhelm, Pickwick. Was Father able to eat his food? Was Betsy's blanket as thin as this one? But these thoughts led to such despair that I soon learned not to give in to them. In an effort to fix my mind on something, I asked Frau Mikes to teach me the card game that she played hour after hour. She had made the cards herself with the squares of toilet paper that were issued two a day to each prisoner. All day, she sat on a corner of the cot, endlessly laying them out in front of her and gathering them up again. I was a slow learner since no cards of any kind had been played at the Baye. Now, as I began to grasp the solitary game, I wondered what father's resistance to them had been. Surely nothing could be more innocent than this succession of shapes called clubs, spades, diamonds. But as the days passed, I began to discover a subtle danger. When the cards went well, my spirits rose. It was an omen. Someone from Harlem had been released. But if I lost, Maybe someone was ill. The people in the secret room had been found. At last, I had to stop playing. In any case, I was finding it hard to sit up so long. Increasingly, I was spending the days as I did the nights, tossing on the thin straw pallet, trying in vain to find a position in which all aches at once were eased. My head throbbed continually. Pain shot up and down my arms. My cough brought up blood. I was thrashing feverishly on the cot one morning when the cell door opened and there stood the steel-voiced matron I'd seen the night I entered the cell two weeks before. Ten boom, Cornelia. I struggled to my feet. Bring your hat and coat and come with me. I looked around at the others for a hint of what was happening. You're going outside, our prison expert said. When you take your hat, you always go outside. My coat I was wearing already, but I took the hat from its hook and stepped out into the corridor. The matron relocked the door, then set off so rapidly that my heart hammered as I trotted after her, careful to stay on the precious matting. I stared yearningly at the locked doors on either side of us. I could not remember behind which ones my sisters had disappeared. 
At last, we stepped out into the broad, high-walled courtyard. Sky. For the first time in two weeks, blue sky. How high the clouds were, how inexpressibly white and clean. I remembered suddenly how much sky had meant to Mama. Quick, snapped the matron. I hurried to the shiny black automobile beside which she was standing. She opened the rear door and I got in. Two others were already in the back seat, a soldier and a woman with a gaunt gray face. In front, next to the driver, slumped a desperately ill-looking man whose head lolled strangely on the seat back. As the car started up, the woman behind me lifted a blood-stained towel to her mouth and coughed into it. I understood. The three of us were ill. Perhaps we were going to a hospital. The massive prison gate opened and we were in the outside world. Spinning along broad city streets, I stared in wonderment through the window. People walking, looking in store windows, stopping to talk with friends. Had I truly been as free as that only two weeks ago? The car parked before an office building. It took both the soldier and the driver to get the sick man up three flights of stairs. We entered a waiting room jammed with people and sat down under the watchful eye of the soldier. When nearly an hour had passed, I asked permission to use the laboratory. The soldier spoke to the trim, white uniformed nurse behind the reception desk. This way, she said crisply. She took me down a short hall, stepped into the bathroom with me and shut the door. Quick, is there any way I can help? I blinked at her. Yes, oh yes, a Bible. Could you get me a Bible and a needle and thread and a toothbrush and soap? She bit her lip doubtfully. So many patients today and the soldier, but I'll do what I can and she was gone. But her kindness shone in the little room as brightly as the gleaming white tiles and shiny faucets. My heart soared <clears throat> as I scrubbed the grime off my neck and face. A man's voice at the door. Come on, you've been in there long enough. Hastily, I rinsed off the soap and followed the soldier back to the waiting room. The nurse was back at her desk. Coolly efficient as before, she did not look up. After another long wait, my name was called. The doctor asked me to cough, took my temperature and blood pressure, applied his stethoscope and announced that I had pleurisy with effusion, pre-tubercular. He wrote something on a sheet of paper, then with one hand on the doorknob, he laid the other for an instant on my shoulder. I hope, he said in a low voice, that I'm doing you a favor with this diagnosis. In the waiting room, the soldier was on his feet, ready for me. As I crossed the room, the nurse rose briskly from the door and whisked past me. In my hand, I felt a small knobby something wrapped in paper. I slid it in my coat pocket. As I followed the soldier down the stairs, the other woman was already back in the car. The sick man did not reappear. All during the return ride, my hand kept straying to the object in my pocket, stroking it, tracing the outline. Oh Lord, it's so small, but still it could be, let it be a Bible. The high walls loomed ahead. The gate rang shut behind us. At last, at the end of the long echoing corridor, I reached my cell and drew the package from my pocket. My cellmates crowded around me as I unwrapped the newspaper with trembling hands. Even the Baroness stopped her pacing to watch. As two bars of precious pre-war soap appeared, Frau Mikes clapped her hand over her mouth to suppress her yelp of triumph. No toothbrush or needle, but unheard of wealth, a whole packet of safety pins and most wonderful of all, not indeed a whole Bible, but in four small booklets, the four gospels. I shared the soap and pins among the five of us, though I offered to buy the book as well, they refused. 
They catch you with those, the knowledgeable one said, and it's double sentence and kalta cost as well. Kalta cost the bread ration alone without the daily plate of hot food. Was the punishment constantly held over our heads? If we made too much noise, we'd have kalta cost. If we were slow with a bucket, it would be kalta cost. But even Calta Kos would be a small price to pay, I thought, as I stretched my aching body on the foul straw for the precious books I clutched between my hands. And I'm stopping there. In my book, it's on page 160. <clears throat> so she's in a prison, but it doesn't sound like a concentration camp. It sounds like a Dutch prison that um, people are just waiting in. Um, sounds like she is, has some nice people with her, but it's only a couple of feet wide and a couple of feet long, and there are five of them in the room. Uh, what was it that, uh, the Baroness took just five, six steps in, <clears throat> and then would turn around and take six more steps. That's a pretty small room. Why don't you try and take six steps and see how long the room is. And in that room, and it's only as wide as the door, they had five people who needed to sleep. Okay, well, we'll continue with this, and uh, it will um, all probably still take place in the same, same prison because it's still the same chapter. Okay, bye-bye.